on Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We'll start it tonight and then we'll continue it until we finish at least chapter, uh, chapter 12. See what the Lord has for us. Father, again tonight, I thank and praise you for the privilege of standing behind this desk, preaching your gospel. I acknowledge again that in myself, I am nothing. Without you, I can do nothing. Therefore, I'm asking for the next few minutes of time that you would grant unto me, your servant, the ability to preach the message that you have put upon my heart. May the Holy Spirit go before me tonight, touch each and every one of us, that we would receive with understanding what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. We will be sure and careful to give you all the praise and all the glory for all that is accomplished. I ask it in Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. 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 Romans chapter 12. I want to begin reading at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I ask us to, to think about what the Apostle Paul is sharing with us here, that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. What does he mean by that? How do we present our bodies as a sacrifice? How do we do it? The Apostle Paul tells us. Let me share with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to read verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He said, I keep my body. In other words, I do not give in to my body. The things that I might like to do, the things that seem praiserable, things that I did before I was saved that I knew were wrong, I do not do them. I keep my body under control. I stay in the Word, I stay in prayer, and keep it under control. And I notice, I ask you to notice, I beseech. Paul is saying, I'm begging you. You've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Let's go on. I'm begging you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Give up those things that you know that are not pleasing and acceptable to God. Those things that you know that God doesn't want us to do and tells us not to do. Give it up as a sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect Will of God. Okay. Verse 2. Conformed. Conform means to be similar to or adopt, or pardon me, similar to and to adapt oneself to prevailing standards or customs. In other words, to adapt ourselves to the Bible, to the Word of God, to live the Christian life. Stepping out of the old to live the Christian life. Okay. Prevailing standards or customs. Now let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to read verses 16 through 18. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Let's pause there for a moment and listen to what Paul is saying to us, what the Word of God is saying to us. We are the temple of the living God. He lives within us. You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Shall be my people. Think about it. 
God will live and dwell in verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Okay. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay. Verse 1 and 2 go together. Paul is telling us what we need to do as believers. And you notice, God said, come out from among them. From among who? From among the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. In other words, stop living like and thinking like the world. It grieves my heart as a pastor, as a minister, as a true believer. It grieves my heart when I see Christians, men and women, young boys, young girls, when I see them dressing like the world, dressing like the world, copying the world, covering their bodies with tattoos and, and etc. They're just joining with the world. God says, come out from among them and be separate. We're not to look like the world. We're not to act like the world. We're to look like Jesus. Conduct ourselves as men and women of God. Men and women. Say, how do I look like Jesus? Start living the life and others will see Jesus in you. He'll, they'll see Jesus in you. So the word transform means to change in character. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. To be changed in character. Stop looking like, acting like, and thinking like the world, and change to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. Verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man, that is every person, every person among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay. Not to think highly of ourselves. Okay. Not to think that we're better than other people. We're the best. No. God created us, every one of us equally, and we're to accept everyone equally. Not to think that I'm better than this or I'm better than that. We're all created equally. Not to think that we're better. Not to think that we can do things better than others. We're all equal. Okay. Extreme qualities of fancy, emotion, or prejudice. Excessive or extreme qualities of fancy or prejudice. Folks, as Christians... We're to rise above those things and to start acting and being like Jesus. Looking at verse 4 and 5. For, uh, for we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ, and everyone members of one another. Let's stop and think about this. Just a moment, we're going to go to... Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and, and read what the Bible says about it. But I want us to think for a moment. When we come together in Bethany Assembly, and this is our church and we're all attending, folks, we are brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. No one is better than the others. There's no big me and little use. We're all equal. And we're to love one another equally, not pick and choose. I've said it before, but we're not to pick and choose. We're all brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And we're to love each other equally. That's what the, the Bible teaches us. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read verses 18 through 27. And I want us to listen carefully. But now hath God set the members, 
Every one of them, and let me pause right there for a minute. Remember I said when we come together as, as a body here at Bethany Assembly, why are you here? But now hath God set the members, every one in the body, as it has pleased him. You're here because God brought you here. God placed you in this body that we can share with one another. Verse, next verse, please. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Okay. But now are they many members, but one body? Okay. Not all separate. We're all members, but we're one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. What is he saying here? As brothers and sisters in the body, we cannot look around at others and say, you know, we really don't need that person. We don't need that person. God placed us together and we need one another. Every one of us has something to contribute to the body. We need to get that in our hearts and in our minds. God has placed us here and each one of us has something to contribute to, contribute to the body. Okay. There's someone in this body that you can minister to. Each one of us. God has placed us here for that purpose. Verse 22. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Okay. Now let me just share an experience that I had on that line. Several years ago, we had a young couple that were, had just gotten their uh, ordination to be missionaries. He said he felt a call to Alaska, to the deepest part. And we were having, they were here on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And Sunday night we'd gathered around and were praying for them. And I, I looked, at, his name was Alan, and I looked at him and I thought, he was thin, he was kind of frail looking. And I thought to myself, you'll never make it in Alaska. You'll never make it in that cold, cold place where you're going. You know, what was I doing? I was judging somebody else, thinking, you're just not strong enough. You're, you're not going to be able to do it. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Let me go on to tell you. Alan and his wife went to Alaska. They spent almost six years in Alaska and did a tremendous work. Even got a Bible school going. Why? Because God chose them. When we look at the body, we look at one another. Let's don't think, well, I don't see anything that person can do. We're all equal. God's put us here to share with one another, to bless one another. Okay, let's go on. Verse 23. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, Upon the, those we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Those that we look at and think they can't do that. Okay. I've had individuals when we needed teachers. I've had individuals that I felt God wanted to teach, and they so tell, "Oh, Pastor, I can't do that. I, I, I just I could never be a teacher." We're going to see something about that in just a minute. Okay. But listen, those that we just don't think can make it, are, are, God said he puts more abundant honor upon them. For our comely parts have no need, but God have tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacketh. Okay. That there should be no chism in the body, but the member should have the same care one for another. Let's hold that there for a minute, and I want to read it again in a minute, but I'm going to ask you a question. 
When we have needs in the body, and we have had some that have uh, just like Nelson and Vetra, Sister Consuelo, Sister Grace, that have deep physical needs. They've been very sick. I thank God tonight that uh, this evening I got a call from Sister Grace. She's home. She sounded so much better. She said, there's still some things that I have to go through, but I'm, I'm feeling much better. They ran the final test on her, and she's negative now. She does not have COVID. And, she feel, and her voice is so much better. And I, I thank God for that. Okay. But I want to ask you, when we have situations like that, do you, and please no show of hands, this is between you and God, do you personally take time to pray for those individuals? They're in the body. They're a part of us. We need them. And they need us. Do we take time? to pray for them? Do we take time to ask God, is there something that I could do to help them? Do we care for the body is what I'm asking us. Folks, we're all together. We're all together. And to be the true body of Christ, we need to love and care for one another. That there should be no chism in the body, but the members should have the same care one for another. So let me encourage you tonight. When you see somebody that's regularly attending and they're not here, pray for them. Pray for them. Try to find out, is there something wrong? Are they sick? Is there a need? Let's pray for them. Let's hold them up. Would to God that we would give them a call. I, I missed you Sunday morning. Are you all right? Is there anything you need? Let them know that we do love them, that we're thinking them about one another. Okay. Next verse, please. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. How many know that if you hurt yourself, you feel it in your whole body. Everything hurts. It's the way it should be in the body of Christ. One member is suffering. We should all feel that need and that pain for that individual. To love them, to care for them. Because now you are the body of Christ. And members in particular. You see, when we're doing what the Lord tells us to do, when we're living as the true body of Christ, okay, now you are in the body of Christ and members in particular. What is it? You're a great, a great part of the body. Verse 28, please. Okay, we'll go on then. Let's look, take a look at chat, verse 6. Verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. Okay. I want us to think about something. God gives us, through the Holy Spirit, gifts that are to be used in the body. All of those gifts are to be used in the body. The gift of prophecy. Okay. He says, if he gives us the gift of prophecy, let us prophesy according to our portion of faith. Wait upon the Lord and don't be, when God gives you a word, don't be afraid to speak that word. Bring it forth. Boldly bring it forth because it's a word from God for the body. And he wants us, to, every, all of us to hear it, to be edified, to be built up. God doesn't tear the body down. He builds it up. And so if God desires to use you in the gift of prophecy, 
And again, I want to remind you, the Apostle Paul says this to us about the gifts. Pray earnestly for the best gifts. Paul tells us to pray for the gifts and to pray earnestly. God wants to use every one of us. But we've got to be willing. We've got to make ourselves available. So if he gives you the gift of prophecy, don't be afraid to use it. When he puts it upon your heart and you know that it's a word from God, boldly bring it forth. God's wanting to say something to the body. Or ministry. Let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teaches on teaching. Now, I want to draw your attention to the first portion of that. Or ministry. Let us wait on our ministry. I ask you to think about this for a moment. Let us wait on our ministry. Okay. What does that word wait mean? Pray. Get alone with God and pray. Pray over the ministry he's given you. If you're to speak, pray over the message. Pray and seek God until he gives you a message and then pray over that message that he will anoint it and anoint you to bring it forth. To bring it forth. Those of you that are teaching are going to be teaching. It's a ministry God has given you. Pray over it. Every Sunday, before, or ever, throughout the week before Sunday comes, be prayed up, ready to present the lesson, ready to do the teaching. Okay? I want us to take a look at this, verse 6. According to the grace that is given to us, John chapter 3, verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. We can't receive anything unless God, God gives it to us. So if he's given you the gift of teaching, if he's called you to be a teacher, he's given you that gift, use it for the glory of God. Don't say, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I could never do that. I could never be a teacher. My Bible tells me I can do all things through Christ Jesus whom strengthened me. If he's called me to do it, I can do it. Why? Because he'll never ask us to do anything that he doesn't give us the ability to do it. So, if he's called you to teach, then step forward and say, I'm available. I, I will do it. I will teach. Okay. Let's look at verse 7. On ministry, again, let us wait on our ministry. Okay. As I said, that word wait means pray. Pray earnestly. Okay. I know, as your pastor, I know that I cannot do anything without him. If I stepped up to this pulpit and haven't spent time praying and reading and preparing, if I stepped at this pulpit without prayer, I have nothing to offer you. Nothing. We need to pray over the gift that the Lord has given us. Pray so that we may, so that we may be led by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to read verses 1 through 5. And I, brethren... When I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Okay, what is Paul saying? Now remember, the Apostle Paul was the greatest evangelist, evangelist missionary that there's ever been. All over Asia Minor, preaching the gospel, establishing churches, one time he's caught up into heaven, the third heaven, and God reveals everything to him. Okay. So he's telling us, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech. Paul was very well educated, sitting under the feet of the most noted scholar of his day, Gamel. Gamel taught him. Okay. He was highly educated, but he didn't come toting his education. I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, 
declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined, and I love this, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. What does he say? I didn't flaunt my education. I didn't try to show you how much knowledge I had. He said, I didn't do, all I wanted was to present Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He recognized, he recognized that without the Lord, without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he couldn't do what he was doing. And it brought trembling and fear to him. Okay. Goes on to say, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Would you bring that back, please, David? I want to draw to you something here. Look again. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. When Paul preached, he was prayed up. He was full of the Holy Spirit, prayed up, and God used him mightily. Okay? Things happened. People were healed. The sick were healed. Souls were saved. The unsaved and, and unbelievers got mad enough they wanted to kill Paul because he preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. He preached the true gospel. He held nothing back. He didn't sugarcoat the gospel. He didn't try to make it a, a real easy thing. All you have to do is, no. He preached the full gospel. Jesus Christ came to save sinners of which I am teaching chief. Jesus Christ died for my sins and for your sins. He preached it solidly. Okay. Let's go on, please. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's just wait a minute. All right. But in the power of God. Folks, we have nothing in ourselves. Without him, we have nothing to offer. But when we're prayed up, full of the Holy Spirit, God can use us. So that's what he's saying. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. I don't want you, Paul said, I don't want you to look at me. That's not what I'm here for. I want you to see Jesus. I want you to hear the word of God. All right. Let's go on. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Okay. We need to pray constantly that we be led by the power of God. Now, folks, I want to remind you, we're in the body. We're all a part of this body. We all represent Jesus Christ. When we're outside, we represent Bethany Assembly and what Bethany Assembly believes in. Okay. So, he that exhorteth on exhortation. Ex uh, to exhort means to lift up one another, to build up, to bring an, an enticing word that will encourage individuals. It doesn't always have to be from the pulpit. It can be a one-on-one -on -one sharing Jesus Christ with others. He that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with di di diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. With cheerfulness. Folks, again, I, I want to draw your attention to the latter part of that. He that showeth mercy let him do it with cheerfulness. When you're going to do something for someone, do it cheerfully. Do it gratefully. I'm happy 
to be able to, to do something for you. May even be somebody you don't particularly care for. But there's a need. And the Lord lays it on your heart. Cheerfully minister to that need. Not, not fake, not hypocrisy. Let them know it's coming from your heart. Cheerfully meet that need. I want to stop here tonight at, at verse 8. We're, next Wednesday night, Dale will be here. The following Wednesday, we're going to finish on Ro, uh, Romans chapter 12. I ask you tonight to prayerfully consider the things that we have shared tonight. Ask God to help us, every one of us, to really be a part of the body of Christ. To show that true love one for another. It's easy. It's easy to greeting somebody coming in or going out. Shake their hand or give them a hug and say, I love you. But do we really mean it? Is it just a word or do we really mean it? Do you really in the Lord love that individual? Let's pray together that God give every one of us a true love for one another. Father, tonight I thank and praise you for the privilege of sharing your word. I'm asking tonight, may the Holy Spirit quicken the truth of your word to each and every one of our hearts. May we take time, may we take time to read over the first eight verses of Romans 12 to get alone with our Bible and just prayerfully read those first eight verses and let you quicken the truth of it to our hearts. Call to our remembrance what we've discussed and may we purpose, I am a part of the body of Christ of Bethany Assembly. I ask it tonight in Jesus' name. God's people said, Amen. Amen.